Dawn Rosenquist, and welcome to Character in Context, where I usually teach the historical and ancient sociological context of scripture with an eye to developing the character of the Messiah, but not right now. Right now, I am doing a series about how not to waste your time with bad study practices, bad resources, and just the general confusion that I faced when I started studying the Bible and was trying to figure out what to do and whose books I should read. You know, bottom line, I read a lot of nonsense and I spent a ton of money on it. I'm going to give you some of the basics on how to avoid a lot of the pitfalls, save money, maximize your time and effort, and get the most out of what you're doing and spending. And I will be making uh, a separate blog post, in addition to the transcript here, um, with a recommended resource list for different areas of studying, because... There's so much that goes into the Bible and understanding it as an ancient document. And no, no one will ever master it entirely. I doubt everybody has their little specialties. But every little bit that you can open that window really lets more light in. So it, it's good. Anyway, so last week we talked about what makes a resource just nothing you want to waste time, brain cells, or money on. So this week we're going to begin talking about how to put together a really great library and to save money doing it, hopefully, unless you're like me and you just say, well, I bought that book for a fraction of what I could have spent, you know, if it wasn't on sale. So now I can buy three or four books. That's what I do. That's yeah, you're not saving money when you do that. Now, the first thing I want to cover is source material and the difference between primary, secondary and tertiary sources. Now, a primary source is something original, all right? Excavate the Temple of Ishtar in Nineveh, find a trove of cuneiform tablets, translate them, and write a book about them. So the temple itself and all its measurements, maps, and data, and the tablets are all primary sources. They are essentially ground zero for learning about how Ishtar was worshipped, and by the way, the analysis didn't do Alexander Hislop any favors, let me tell you and about general temple operations, what the temple purchased uh, for, you know, because it was like a little city, what they stored there, what they used, etc. That's why it's called a primary source, because it's, it's raw information, okay? It's as close to the truth as you can get, or, or at least what they thought of as the truth, right? Now the buck stops with the primary source and then it gets translated and anim analyzed and studied. A secondary source, on the other hand, is much different. If the cuneiform tablets are the primary source, the translation of the tablet is a secondary source. It isn't identical to the original because words and concepts had to be transferred from one language to another and sometimes we won't have any idea, and not even with context, of what a particular word means. Uh, I mean, it happens with Biblical Hebrew as well, with terms like Maserot, where there is no certainty of knowing the meaning. The primary source material is somehow altered from its original state through analysis, translation, transliteration, or interpretation. Analysis would be like a scholarly paper looking at how an ancient document compares to others or about the words used or the genre. Is it a receipt or is it mythology? Translation is taking something from the original language and doing the best job you can to honestly put it into the words and concepts of an entirely different language and culture, and it's an incredibly difficult thing to do. Transliteration is different. That's taking words from a language with a unique alphabet and using a second alphabet to try and recreate the same sounds. It's actually how we went from the Hebrew Yeshua to the Greek Jesus to the Latin Jesus to Jesus. There is no Y, Y sound in Greek, or the SH either, and men's names could not end with an alpha, but needed to have a sigma instead. Makes my head spin thinking about what these guys had to come up with, and, and now the poor guys get called pagans for it. Interpretation is what happens when we take the primary material and decide what it means. For example, 
if we are sitting on a trove of tablets and most of them order one sheep plus some wine and fine ground wheat, but then you find one where they order like a hundred sheep and a buttload of wine and, you know, stop laughing. It's a real word. It means 384 gallons. You know, you might interpret the difference as meaning that there was either a festival day or a coronation taking place at the temple. That's an interpretation. Of course, right now you're saying, hey, wait a minute. Are you saying my English Bible isn't a primary source, but a secondary source? And yes, I am. And more than that, not only are our English Bible's translations, but the translators also have to interpret the original material as well. They have to decide what words are best to use, and that takes a whole lot of understanding about the whole Bible and about the ancient world too. The only exception to this would be if the original authors would do the translations themselves, and then they could say just exactly what they wanted to say, but you know, they're all dead, so tough luck. This can make people really angry, but like the King James Version New Testament wasn't even translated from primary sources. They never used original manuscript or even copies of original manuscripts. Here's a quote from Michael Byrd's very excellent Seven Things I Wish Christians Knew About the Bible. The New Testament of the KJV was based on a translation of the Greek New Testament text compiled by Theodore Beza in 1598, which was based on the edition of Stephanus from 1551, which was based on the third edition of Erasmus's Novum Testamentum. This is the so-called Textus Receptus, or the received text. Yet, as more manuscripts began to be uncovered by intrepid travelers to the libraries and monasteries of the East during the next three centuries, these manuscripts were used in creating new critical editions of the Greek New Testament, which greatly improved the likelihood of recovering a text closer to the original autographs. So, the KJV New Testament wasn't an original translation, and it was based on manuscripts that were actually written closer to our times during the 12th century than the time of Yeshua, or you may call him Jesus. Fortunately, when older and older manuscripts popped up, scholars could get closer and closer to what the original documents might have looked like, and our translations can get more and more accurate. To sum up, many manuscripts are better than the seven, only seven, that the KJV was based on. And by many, I mean almost 6,000 Greek, 10,000 Latin, and over 9,000 other manuscripts in other languages like Arabic and Coptic. All of these sources together give us a bigger picture of what the original documents would have looked like before spelling mistakes, missed words, scribal notes that accidentally got included as text in subsequent copies, you know, etc. I am not bringing this up to destroy faith or to kill the KJV, but just to let you know that um, many people, you know, are talking about good versus bad translation, it's, it's more complicated than they generally let on. Very few Bibles are actually so bad that I would dissuade you from buying one. Exceptions are the Queen James Bible and the, a lot of the Hebrew roots knockoffs, some of which contain medieval midrash masquerading as ancient scripture. They plagiarize legitimate translations by simply substituting in sacred names or were put together by those who didn't know a shred of Hebrew or Greek, and simply opened up Strong's Concordance and prayed about it. And that's actually true. I did not make that up. If you want an educated take on the different translations, my friend James has a YouTube channel called Disciple Dojo, where he reviews them based on content. I'm not going to reinvent the wheel here, but I will put a link to the podcast description when I post this. And if you want to know what Bibles I like, uh, for reading, I love the Tree of Life version. It's a Messianic Jewish Bible, and the, sc the scholarly team that did it is really, really good. And I've gotten hooked on the Christian Standard Bible lately. My uh, my friend who's getting his PhD, he got me hooked on it. I think he got me hooked on the, <laughs> the Tree of Life version, too. 
So we have all of these ancient manuscripts, but what we don't have, and this is true for the Hebrew Bible as well, are autographs. And no, I'm not talking about walking up to Jason Momoa and getting him to sign your cast after you try to stunt from Aquaman. An autograph is what we call the absolute original document in the writer's own handwriting. The original letter to the seven churches of Asia Minor. The original letter to Corinth. The very letter that was written to the believers in Rome telling them about how Yeshua was the Yahweh warrior of Isaiah. You get the idea. Likely those were read until they became so fragile and smudged that they needed to be reproduced by scribes and those copies were reproduced again and again, etc., etc. But the very first one would be an autograph. Any copies would just be called generic manuscripts or fragments. Uh, fragments are a part of a manuscript that's been broken. If you've been listening to my series on the Gospel of Mark, in the very last episode, I talk about how there are actually four different endings to the Gospel of Mark. Um, four different endings, all right? <laughs> and not just spelling mistakes and stuff, but I mean different content. Some short and some long. The oldest and best manuscripts end at Mark 16.8. But later ones have believers drinking poison and handling snakes. Obviously, something went wrong, but no one knows for sure what happened. But by gathering so many sources together, we can make timelines and come up with ideas and answers about when changes were made and where and sometimes even why. It helps scholars to figure out what is original and what's a mistake. This study is called textual criticism. Of course, if all you have is one manuscript, you pretty much can't do that. Because the KJV only worked with seven New Testament manuscripts, there isn't enough information to be sure about what is and isn't right. And because they were all written during the 12th through and the 15th centuries, uh, it means they didn't know for sure what the text looked like earlier than that. So textual criticism is important, but it can also send you off your rocker and into a panic if you're not careful. Totally not something for you to worry about, but it absolutely is very important to understand how we got our Bibles today. My friend Matt Knapper, who is a PhD candidate in Old Testament studies, has been teaching a great series, which I will link in the transcript and on the podcast site. There is one more source, and that is one more kind of source, and that's a tertiary source. Tertiary sources like Wikipedia. Wikipedia can be edited by anyone, so it can't be used as a primary or secondary source, like something official, like a textbook. Um, but what Wikipedia does is list primary and secondary sources in its bibliography section sometimes that you can then check out and read, and then you can cite those books. That isn't to say that all Wikipedia pages are nonsense. It's just that they cannot be relied on as a legitimate source because there is no real accountability or peer review built into the publishing process. If you're ever reading a book that's super informative, you will want to check out the bibliography to find out where the author got their information, and then you can decide if you want to read some of those books. That's actually a great way to learn about who is and who is not an expert in the field. So what will the best books have in common? You know, the ones you should spend your money on. One, they will have a great bibliography. If they don't, then where on earth are they getting their information from? Are there facts, even facts at all? Are they making stuff up? You just won't know for sure if the back of the book is nothing but blank pages or advertisements, right, <laughs> for their other books. Two, they will be written by someone who is an expert in the field, the books in the bibliography. Uh, for example, if someone were to ask me if they should listen to Craig Keener, David DeSilva, or G.K. Beale, I would say absolutely, but... If someone told me that they had written books about Joshua or 1 Samuel, I would be a little bit hesitant. Not because I don't respect them a lot, but because I know 
that they know their stuff when it comes to the Greco-Roman context of the Gospels and the Epistles. If I was going to spend money on a book about Genesis, I would be far more likely to read something written by John Walton, Tremper Longman, or John Salhammer. Now, not just because they are better scholars, but because that is their focus. It isn't enough to have a PhD, okay? To write a textbook or a commentary, you need to be an expert, not just in the Bible, but in that part of the Bible specifically. No one can be an expert in absolutely everything. There's just too much there. <clears throat> now, three, if the book is scholarly, by that I mean as opposed to something more theological. So you got scholars and theologians and they're different. We'll, we'll talk about that more. Then there are going to be a heck ton of footnotes in a, in a scholarly book. So scholarly would include commentaries, journal articles, that sort of thing. They will be books full of facts and that can be proven. And those facts had to come from somewhere. And those somewheres will be found in the detailed footnotes, complete with copyright information, page numbers, supplementary, supplementary notes, or pointing to a book in the bibliography. Footnotes will tell you exactly where someone is getting their information, giving someone else credit for their own hard work. They won't just steal numbers or quotes from other people and not admit it. <clears throat> and because they are giving credit, you can go and read what they wrote to make sure that they're being honest about what the other person says. This is why nonsense books generally just tell a story but don't point you anywhere except back at the author. Scholarly books say, you don't have to take my word for it, here's where I got my information. While opinion books will just give you a story and ask you to believe it. Four, they shouldn't be overly biased or based on opinion. There shouldn't be any agendas that misuse the data to make the information mean something it doesn't. For example, if someone was to write a legitimate scholarly resource comparing complementarian or egalitarian ideas, meaning those who see functional differences with, within the church and, and within marriage between men and women where men can perform functions that women are not permitted to perform, and those who see no barriers except for those that were cultural at one time. <clears throat> and someone's going to do that and be unbiased. They would present all the pros and all the cons of both positions honestly and then fairly state their position. Of course, no one's completely unbiased about those things, uh, but we can be honest, all right? On the other hand, you will find many, many books out there that make their arguments by choosing the verses that support their opinion while conveniently ignoring those that don't. But those aren't scholarly. Those are opinion pieces, and even some of them who do that are written by scholars. So, you know, you got to be careful on those kind of subjects. There's a big difference, okay? And it's important to understand because it is very easy to read a book like that and come away believing that it's the only way to look at the information. Now, a good example would be to ignore any book written by a wealthy slave owner in the 18th century telling everyone why it's okay to kidnap, abuse, and enslave Africans for their own good. And yes, even ministers did this and scholars. Or a book written by a polygynist male about how happy polygyny makes women and how happy it makes God. Okay, just saying. Five, it's not difficult to figure out the credentials of the person who wrote the book if it's scholarly. And uh, furthermore, it's not impossible to find out who they are. Google their name, find out who they are, where and what they teach. Learn about their specialties and check out their other books. But I will say that not all scholars are created equal. I bought a book once about Revelation from a scholar because it was really cheap on Kindle that day. And I got about 20 pages in before I figured out that this scholar was an expert in early Christianity and Gnosticism. And the premise of their book was that the author of Revelation was exposing Paul as the beast. I kid you not. Or maybe it was the false prophet. I can't remember. I returned it, and after that I got more careful about checking credentials. Is like, just no. This sort of thing makes the New York Times bestsellers list, but serious context studies never do. 
Six, their book reviews will be from their own peers in their field of expertise. There are certain names that mean absolute credibility to me. Um, scholars like Craig Keener, Michael Gorman, G.K. Beale, Tremper Longman, Sandra Richter, Carmen Imes, and many others. When you come across a views, reviews from anonymous users and the author's mom, best leave that book on the shelf unless you are personally familiar with that author and know them to be serious and credible. Not everyone has to be a scholar, but at least with scholars, there is accountability. Seven. And, and yeah, I'm, I'm telling people not to buy my books if they're not familiar with me. I mean, yeah. Yeah, it's the same thing, okay? Hold myself to that same, same level of accountability. Seven. If they do have a degree that they are advertising, it will be from a legitimate school. And it won't be honorary. There's a time and a place for honorary degrees, absolutely. My husband and I went into the sciences because of James Duhon playing Scotty on the original Star Trek. And I know we aren't the only ones. And so when the uh, Milwaukee School of Engineering gave him an honorary degree in, um, in engineering, nobody complained. He made engineering cool. But if he had written an engineering textbook using that degree, not cool. That's the case of a legitimate college offering an honorary degree based on some measure of merit. <clears throat> But there's also a problem with what are called diploma mills that will award people doctorates for doing nothing. But I'm going to say this right now. If Duke or Wheaton ever offered me an honorary degree, you know, right before hell froze over, I would show up and accept it out of gratitude and politeness, but I would never use the title. People go through hell and commit their lives and resources to achieving that degree and they have earned it. No matter how much studying I do, no matter how many people I teach or books I write or whatever, I didn't go through the process. The title means something. As an honor, you know, I would be very humbled and touched, but it wouldn't be the same thing as earning it. You know, I do these things because God called me to ministry and that's enough for me just to be doing the work. People who know me by my books, but people who don't have zero reason to trust that I know what I'm talking about, usually. And sometimes I wonder about myself, too. Okay, eight. The book will have been written fairly recently, with notable exceptions. Archaeology, anthropology, sociology, numismatics, linguistics, etc. are changing what we think we know on a fairly regular basis. I mean, not about the important meta-narratives of the Bible or anything, but in terms of ancient Near Eastern and Greco-Roman context, absolutely. If this is what you want to study, then newer is generally better. The best strategy, in all honesty, is to start with tried and true modern scholars who have an excellent reputation for reasonable scholarship. Their books won't be the flashy ones, but they will introduce you to the world of credible study. And there are certain topics that are going to be foundational and easier to start with than others. Of course, everyone will have their favorites. I love sociology, and so I point grown-ups in the direction of David De Silva's excellent honor, patronage, kinship, and purity, which will be released in a second edition on October 4th. Can't wait. When you read that book, he will have footnotes and a bibliography where he cites scholars that he respects. If you are interested in general historical first century context, then Craig Keener is going to be the best choice. Check out the NIV Cultural Background Study Bible. It's a terrific way to become acquainted with the context of the biblical world. And not only is Keener one of the authors, but so is John Walton, another terrific resource. I will have those linked in the transcript so you don't have to write them down. Next week, I want to talk about actually reading the Bible. A lot of people who teach really don't know that much of it, but it's very important for more reasons than just the obvious. To have the Bible, you know, to have a Bible that you can understand, that you can engage with, because until we do that and actually know how to read it as an ancient document, we can get into a lot of trouble building a library. And I'll see you next week. <laughs>